From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Donald Trump's business civil fraud trial begins in New York a week after a judge grants a partial judgment in favor of the state. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnists Kim Strassel and Bill McGurn. Donald Trump has been under investigation by New York Attorney General Letitia James, and the fraud trial in a Manhattan court began on Monday with both of them having a presence in person. Let's start with a clip of the Attorney General outside the courthouse on Monday. Donald Trump and the other defendants have committed persistent and repeated fraud. Last week, we proved that in our motion for summary judgment. Today, uh, we will prove our other claims. My message is simple. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. And it is my responsibility and my duty and my job to enforce it. The law is both powerful and fragile. And today in court, we will prove our case. And here is Donald Trump outside the courthouse. This is a continuation of the single greatest witch hunt of all time. We have a rogue judge who rules that properties are worth a tiny fraction, one one hundred, a tiny fraction of what they actually are. We have a racist attorney general who's a horror show who ran on the basis that she was going to get Trump before she even knew anything about me. She used this to run for governor. She failed in her attempt to run for governor. She had virtually no polling. She came back and she said, well, now I'll go back to get Trump again. And this is what we have. It's a scam. It's a sham. Kim, what is the gist of this case and how do you size it up now that we are going into a civil trial? So this is fundamentally a question. The AG is arguing that Donald Trump as a real estate mogul developer in his interactions with lenders, inflated the financial figures for his real estate. Trump has said that that is not the case. In a ruling that did surprise a lot of people, the judge who was overseeing this case, Arthur Engoran, came out with a partial summary judgment for Letitia James recently, in which he generally agreed with the notion that Trump had inflated a number of those figures and wrote page after page of examples of why he said that was. Now, we can go through that, but that's where things stand as Trump heads into this. Remember, this is a civil trial, so this is very distinct and different from the criminal proceedings that Donald Trump faces, but it is, because of the calendar, one of the first that's now coming up. Some of these judgments about the values of these assets held by President Trump and the Trump Organization seem like they are somewhat subjective. They're based on appraisals. They're based on Trump's own sense of what a property and his brand is worth. One that critics are poking holes in now is the judge's acceptance of some figures from the tax assessments in Florida saying that the Mar-a-Lago estate is worth about $18 million. The New York Post has done some reporting saying that tax assessments are not a good measure of market value and that the property would go on the market for something more like $300 million. On the other hand, Bill, some of these examples seem more cut and dried. One of them is that President Trump's residence in Trump Tower is about 11,000 square feet, and he apparently repeatedly claimed on these financial documents that it was 30,000 square feet. The judge says that, here's a quote from him, defendants absurdly suggest that the calculation of square footage is a subjective process that could lead to differing results or opinions based on the method employed to conduct the calculation. Well, yes, perhaps if the area is rounded or oddly shaped, it is possible measurements of square footage could come to a slightly differing results due to user error. Good faith measurements could vary by as much as 10 to 20 percent, not 200 percent, a discrepancy of this order of magnitude by a real estate developer sizing up his own living space of decades can only be considered fraud. That is the judge's opinion. He goes through a couple other examples. One of them is apparently the Trump team was valuing apartments in New York that were rent regulated as if they were not rent regulated. And so, Bill, some of this is about subjective values, how much puffery is too much in real estate. But there is also some stuff in this ruling that I think would make you raise an eyebrow if you got that from 
Trump in a financial disclosure, I think. Yeah, certainly. Um, I don't think Donald Trump is known. I don't think most real estate developers in New York are known for minimizing the value of their assets. I think there's three things to point out. First of all, the judge doesn't know what the value is. The value comes down to what people will pay for it. And tax assessments are remarkably low. I know my own house, the assessed value is a lot lower than the fair market value. It all depends on what people will pay. And the second thing is that the person who brought this case, the Attorney General, Letitia James, she set out to get Trump. And I think he has a case that she went after him this way. You can view it in isolation about this apartment worth this, but you look at the totality. What Democrat prosecutor in America is not trying to indict Donald Trump for something? So I think a lot of his followers would just think of this as more of the same. It's true that Letitia James has been talking about going after Trump for some time. And we have a clip here of her in 2018. This is from her victory speech the night that she won the attorney general's office. I will be shining a bright light <laughs> into every dark corner of his real estate dealings. And, uh, and every dealing demanding truthfulness at every turn. Kim, I have a couple thoughts here. One is that by that time, there were already allegations swirling in the press about Donald Trump's books. So here's a headline in Forbes in 2017. Donald Trump has been lying about the size of his penthouse. There was also a New York Times report in October of 2018. So a month before Tish James gave that speech. And it talks about the story claims is fraud in the Trump organization in the 1990s using a purported building supply company that made sham invoices on products that were being purchased for the Trump organization, essentially to get tax-free money out of Fred Trump's empire, the president's dad, into the hands of the next generation. And presumably, Letitia James was aware of that as she was campaigning. On the other hand, it strikes me as incredibly corrosive to have a politician campaigning on her victory night speech saying, we are going to investigate this named individual who, by the way, is the head of the other political party, and then playing that for cheers and whoops and applause. Oh, it was outrageous. And I don't think we can say that enough. I mean, she campaigned on this. She promised it as she was going through that victory speech. It kind of reminds you of the old scary Soviet executioner, Barry, at find me the man and I'll find you the crime, going around and promising that you're going to hunt up something on someone, no matter what it is, and get them, and whether or not they are innocent or guilty, is the the worst sort of abuse of prosecutorial power. And I think that that's why it's very difficult to look at this case in a dispassionate way. You have a prosecutor promising that they were going to bring it and ginning up a case where we can talk about this, whether it should have ever been brought, because there is no real victim here. I mean, why does the state of New York need to intervene on behalf of these lenders? Even the judge acknowledged in this piece that there had been no loss for any of Donald Trump's creditors. There were no defaults. There were no breaches. There were no late payments. There was no harm in any way. So who was the crime against? And why does the state have an interest in intervening in this when even the lenders themselves did not go there? And then you also look at the judge's case, too. And yeah, he lists page after page after page of all these things that he claims are inflated values. But when the judge goes out and says, yeah, and Mar-a-Lago is only worth $18 million, and the entire real estate world says, um, actually, is probably more like 300 million, then you lose faith that the judge is also looking at this objectively as well. So I agree with Bill. This is one of those cases where, in general, if you were to say, have a headline, ooh, real estate developer fudges figures with lenders, that is probably one of the least interesting headlines of all time. Doesn't that happen like all the time everywhere? But somehow we're being told that we need to focus on this and that somehow this case is not political at all. It's quite unbelievable. Mm -hmm. 